Okay, buckle in, hands inside the cart. On this edition of Power Forward, we're discussing the ride on the 2023 solar coaster and what lies ahead in 2024 with David Dunlap, VP of Product Strategy in the U.S. with Baywa RE. Okay, so when I say 2023, uh, what are the first things that come to your mind when, uh, when it comes to solar this year? And let's do uh, one negative and one positive to keep things balanced. Broadly, most of us would think about um, policy and finance or interest rate, something like that. But if I were to choose kind of a singular negative first, um, it would be sort of the broad topic of policy changes um, that are directly impacting the economics of solar. And so that um, does include the interest rates, um, changes in financing, financing viability or financing terms, the change in California from NEM2 to NEM3. Uh, all of these basically are causing the, the, what we assumed were the standard way of an economic sale for solar to make sense to be more challenging. Um, it's also had the impact of um, businesses needing to manage their cash differently, manage their uh, the economics of, of their business very, very differently. And sometimes those switches are just um, too too large. And I think the last piece of it that's sort of there is um, when, when all those kinds of challenges are in front of the consumer and the economic argument is not as strong, then uh, there's, a, there's a drop in consumer confidence. But on the positive side, um, I actually think that the price compression that we've seen this year in the long run will, will be a benefit. Generally speaking, price compression improves the economics. Um, it increases the competitive differentiation um, and um, it should remove some of the redundancy and less differentiated offerings out there, um, which tend to add more complexity and chaos. So I think that there's, there's still the opportunity for innovation and competitiveness and when the price spectrum is a little bit too broad, sometimes you miss what that differentiation is. So it's a little bit of a tighter market. We kind of focus on what truly differentiates products and the redundancy tends to get driven out over time. The last uh, time we chatted, we discussed the module market uh, pretty in depth. And I, I wanted to dig into that again. How do you think the module market matched forecasts at this time last year? You know, were we, did we get it right? Did we miss something? If we do rewind a little bit uh, further back, we go to summer of 2022. That was when um, pretty much every company that had manufacturing capability was ramping up and believing that they could capitalize on the high residential module price market in the US. And so the, the um, volumes were um, kind of crazy. That was also the beginning of the two-year presidential moratorium on any new tariffs. So the risk of tariff combined with kind of the historical low detention rate of the UFLPA created a window of opportunity for those importers to say, now's our chance to, to get in on the American market. At this time last year, we probably were under forecasting what the oversupply would be because mm -hmm. we were at the very beginning of um, seeing that oversupply and we didn't really understand how soft the market would get. I think in turn that decline of the resi demand was under forecast and nobody really wanted to believe that it was going to uh, decline as much as it has in the second half of the year. And yeah, as a result, by the end of the, the second quarter this year was really when we understood, you know, the, the full magnitude of the contraction. So I think that in Q4 of 2022, we just didn't want to believe that it would go dip this low. So that's uh, a, a good rewind on you know where we were at this time last year. So now, this time this year, uh, what are we thinking right now? Um, and I guess I wanted you to also touch on any new developments with the UFLPA detentions. Because this week we were, we were reported that some mod modules with China Poly have been released by customs, which may, maybe signals that more is to come. I do believe that we're... Um, some manufacturers are starting to see a potential end to the, the excess. And I think this is where the UFLPA comes in is um, now we're two, three years into the process. Um, the CBP really understands their job. They know what documentation looks like and they're starting to ask for it from a lot more companies. I wanna make a, a, a sort of a clarification. Um, in the industry, we use the term detention a lot and we, 
feel like that means a, a company has been blacklisted. The act of detaining the product is part of the inspection process. So CBP's job is to detain product that they need to inspect and validate for its material sourcing. Um, so if a, if a company is detained, that's not a bad thing. That's CBP doing their job, right? And I think we're going to see a lot more companies that actually have put together that clean supply chain and being able to bring it in. If we were to count the number of actual manufacturing companies that have had to prove their uh, supply chain and documentation, it's probably still in the low tens um, out of 50, 60 companies, right? That potentially could be bringing in product. So it just hasn't run its course through all of them. They just started with the biggest ones. And, and some of those big companies, they may have those relationships, but they also have other supply chains, soup to nuts, in outside of China. Um, Trina, Longji, JA, uh, Jinko, all of these companies, they have multiple supply chains. Um, and for the U.S. supply, they are able to put together 100% document to clean supply chains for their US supply. Um, and, and that's what we're seeing now is those companies have it and can prove it and other companies are starting to show up and say, yeah, we, we can too. So I do think that we should expect more and more of the UFLPA inspections and detentions with a, uh, a better understanding and more regular clearing of those companies that have the good clean supply chains. And now maybe back to your crystal ball for a second on the demand side of things, you know, you noted that that was maybe where we didn't, um, weren't prepared for what resi demand was going to be in 2023. What are we, what are we thinking for next year? Right now, most of the analysts are calling for relatively flat, maybe slightly still down year over year for 24 to 2023. So that would indicate to me that we're kind of approaching the trough, right? And so maybe Q1 has normal seasonality over Q4 that we, we've we come to expect, um, but then Q2 should be sort of flat leveling off and then start to, to grow back in the, in the second half of next year. I think that there's still a challenge um, for ourselves in the way that we measure the growth of of the industry by virtue of um, measuring the, the amount of installed PV watts. And this is interesting in California where the, the policy changes have slowed down the rate of sis new system installs dramatically. They've also, it's curtailed the size explosion of each system, right? Because it wasn't lucrative to put in, you know, a 20 kilowatt system and get all of that retail rate rebate from the utility. Now we're right-sizing the system. So we're putting in fewer systems because they're more expensive and harder to do. They're smaller and we're adding storage to them. According to our metric, where we're measuring the amount of PV watts installed per roof and the number of installations, that looks like it's tanking. And, it, and that's what the numbers are showing in California, right? Is the number of installs and the PV watts installed is tanking. But if you look at um, the dollar value of those systems, adding storage to them, uh, whatnot, it's not as bad as it sounds. The two other things I'm thinking about for that crystal ball for 2024 is um, that, you know, in the second half of the year, the, the presidential waiver on new tariffs, uh, I mentioned that expires. Uh, so even though we're, we've kind of wrapped up the oxen petition case, um, and that's fairly clear uh, who's eligible, who's not, that enforcement of that would, would come into play. So I think that curtails the oversupply a little bit. Um, and then with the narrower range in the average selling price that has occurred over the course of this year, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think there's a, um, a little bit more of a pure competition based on true product differentiation. And if you don't, if you can't bring a product to market that is truly differentiated, um, then it's just sort of the same as something else. And there just can't be enough room in a tight buyer's market for too many choices. With that as our kind of baseline of expectations and maybe some, and based off of the conversations maybe you've had with your customers, um, and there, do you have any uh, words of caution or, um, to share or maybe questions installers should be asking themselves right now? I think my advice would be, um, kind of consistent to what I've been saying this this whole year so far is just really encouraging every business owner to to truly understand their choice of business strategy and how you are addressing your cash flow and your revenue streams. 
if you're being reactive to the market and you're chasing opportunities, but you don't really understand the complexity or you don't have a real financial plan for doing that, I think it's risky. I think it's it it can lead. It's it's not this uh, wonderful um, seller's market open opportunity pipeline that we've enjoyed in the past few years, where you can make some mistakes and it's kind of masked by the the over demand, over interest. So. Um, with the, the challenges on doing it right, doing it profitably, I think you really need to be clear about what your business strategy is. I also think that it's important, uh, and I'm, I'm starting to see it, that um, some installers are getting tired of, of chasing um, the, the low price or, or even the old uh, kind of business models that used to work and being reactive to the market. Um, I think uh, it's time for business owners to really understand and feel that they're in the driver's seat. They're the ones mastering their own destiny. The ones that are kind of not clearly doing that or, and sort of being pushed around by the market, I, hey, I don't have a choice, this is what's happening to me. They're the ones that are being forced into a dead end or forced into a cash flow position that's untenable. So for uh, the installers out there who are in the driver's seat or want to be in the driver's seat and um, are maybe a little bit worried about their status quo residential solar installation business for whatever reason, are there any new opportunities that they should be keeping an eye on, that you're keeping an eye on? One is, uh, I'll say it again, I'm doubling down on uh, encouraging folks to consider becoming electrification contractors rather than just solar installers. Um, I think diversifying your service offerings to your uh, to your customers is paramount for all the reasons I just stated, right? If, if you're doing fewer installations in a year, do more with each installation and have repeat business with your existing customers. That'll reduce your customer acquisition cost, keep your crew busy. There's a lot more things that you can do that add value, real value uh, for, for the homeowners. And I think the second is really um, consider adding a, a a, a truly robust O&M or service uh, channel as a revenue stream, not just something that you have to do to support your installations. Actually make it a viable business model um, and, and understand how it's going to be profitable in its own right. I think that that service uh, requirement in the market is only going to get bigger over time. We're really just starting to hit that 15 year maturity phase of of some of the earlier installs and a lot of the original contractors that installed those are no longer in business and if you want to be around you should consider taking advantage of those service opportunities in our next episode of power forward i as a preview i want to fully focus on california's solar market which is seeing uh public uh, changes from the public utility um, in terms of the value of solar and storage. And uh, there's a lot of angst, at least in my inbox, about what's going on there. Um, but just quickly before we uh, I let, you, let you go, I was curious on a scale of one to 10, how worried I should be if I'm a California solar uh, installer right now. Changes like this, there's ample opportunity to be worried. Um, I think there certainly are more challenges on the financial ROI for solar. Um, and, uh, but I also believe it's a resilient market. Um, there's still a lot of investment in California. There's a lot of incentives. Um, there are plenty of policies that still really support solar, right? The, the mandate for all new homes must have solar. So if I had to pick a number, I'd say somewhere around four or five. Okay. There's some that will put that number uh, probably much higher. So that's, that's, that's higher, good yeah. to know. <laughs> and that, that's a good, that's a good teaser. Uh, for the next uh, episode, I think, to uh, understand that four and five, and uh, maybe we can um, maybe soothe some of uh, people's fears or give them some more stuff to think about next year. David, again, thanks for taking the time. A great wrap up of 2023. And I'm uh, pretty excited and interested to see what happens in 2024 to see, especially if you nail those predictions, uh, you know, maybe a little bit better than we did last year. huh? Hopefully. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs>